name is Sister Nina, and um, I just, do I look at the camera or do I look at the? The camera, you look at the people, and, the and camera could, will catch you. Could you speak okay. up for you those of us in the back who have hard of hearing? Yes, ma'am. Um, Thank you. So um, we have, as Brother Farouk mentioned, we have quite a task at hand and, um, you know, we want to see progress. And, you know, I hope that my, um, my experience in um, both in and, in and outside of government will help facilitate moving us forward, propelling us forward. Um, I've done project management. Um, I, I am by trade, by um, background, I'm an urban planner. And so civic engagement, um, project management, moving project, development management is uh, one of the things that I'm, you know, my strong suits. Um, I also was um, an adjunct professor, so I do like to teach. I like to, to, to make sure that everything that I have, I can impart to the, the everyday citizens, and which is one of the things that we also did in planning, you know, we would explain the development process, explain the development code, and just how each person could navigate that. And so, um, what I'm hoping my role um, for Freedom Village will be to not only um, easily, um, seamlessly um, ease into the fabric of the Greater Sparta area, but we can be also a beacon and also, you know, kind of a um, a blueprint for those other communities that are similar to us that we can kind of pave the way and show what we've done. So I'm hoping that we can move the needle, we can push forward because this this is an idea whose time is overdue. And so I'm, I'm hoping, you know, everyone's here is committed, I can see that. And I'm just hoping that this is, you know, can be the place that we all envision it to be. If anyone has any questions in terms of... You still have uh, four minutes of presentation. You oh, really? open that up to question instead. That was... I, I, I think it's really probably important to even think about... Like, some people have a more emotional uh, thought pattern when they deal with problems, but your method of problem solving, mm -hmm. something that's more analytical, mm -hmm. I think that that's really important to understand that thought pattern and how you solve right. problems. Right. Um, my, my approach to problems is very <laughs> pragmatic. Um, you know, I think that... Um, just as black people, we are very um, tethered to the emotional side of things because, you know, that's who we are. Our hearts, the way we function, um, the way we love, the way we look at the greater society um, is more on the emotional side. And sometimes it can hinder us, hinder our progress. Um, but I'm, um, I've am i been told that <laughs> I um, can be appear cold and detached, but, you know, I like to compartmentalize um, problems and I don't focus on the problems I only focus on the solutions because sometimes we can get so bogged down in the problem talking about the problem as opposed to okay here's the problem how do we solve it and so I'm very pragmatic in my approach to solving problems um, I look at things within the confines of the government and I also look at things that um, aren't said because there's there's a written thing there's a written set of rules in any kind of development code zoning code, and there's also what's unwritten. So you look at the things and you say, okay, this was spelled out, you know, verbatim, but let's look at what wasn't spelled out. And so so I approach um, problem solving in different ways. I approach um, um, things that can be incremental, incrementally or low-hanging fruit, and I also look at, you know, sometimes 10, 15 years down the road planning horizon. And so I think if you look at things and you, and you kind of take them off in small winnable elements along as long as you're keeping that further goal you know because we're we're creating this for um, something our children that will outlive us so that's kind of the approach that I'm looking at like I'm not creating this for me in the interim yes I want a place where I can be my authentic <coughs> self but long term I want a place where you know my my daughter and your children can also grow and develop and and expand um, and so um, that's my approach, very um, pragmatic and also, um, what do you call it, um, step by step, because that's kind of speaks to my, my training, um, you know, in government training. And so because they have, a, they have a system of things and we can, we can say all day, you know, the problems of the, of the greater society, we can talk about um, the problems with the government, but as Brother Farouk mentioned, you know, we're creating something that even if we were to, you know, depart tomorrow, will outlive us, and because the structure is there, and 
hopefully we can create something that's infallible and that you know can stand as long as the constitution that governs this uh, this country. Was that enough time? Yes, yeah, you're, you're, you're at 4.30. Okay. So, um, Sabina, do you have a question from the room or from yourself? Is, is anybody pass me the questions that you might have? Uh, I don't know where to listen now. You were supposed to write them down and test them. Uh, I mean, I, sit, I didn't get it come around. It's important that we follow. No, take any, any sheet of paper. Take <laughs> any sheet of paper. No, there wasn't a lesson. No one no, do, you, do you have a question that you want yeah. to ask? Uh, yeah. I think we can give the floor. Sister Bayana, yeah. okay. that would be your question. It's Tim. <laughs> so let me. The, the question will be asked. And you have three minutes to respond. Um, what previous work have you done in the community and um, across community, um, serving both previous and current? And how does it? How does your experience qualify you to want to take this particular seat? Right. So um, I work for also work for a nonprofit. So I've kind of run the gamut of uh, working for private consulting firms, working for um, city and county governments. But my um, role has always been community engagement to make sure that the community is aware of uh, either projects that may affect their property, um, sending out notices to let people know that hey, this this development is occurring, and this is why you should come. Because if you don't come, then like Brother Farouk was saying. Things are going to continue to develop whether or not you participate or not. And so, but it's, it's important for each citizen to be heard and for, for their, their um, thoughts and concerns to be addressed. One of the things that I did in, um, well, my previous job, I worked for a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., and we actually went out to the, to the residents and we conducted surveys asking all of the, the residents in the, the seven wards. D.C. is broken up into seven wards from the most impoverished war to, to the most, um, you know, the highest income war. And they ran the gamut. No two people's, even <laughs> within the, the impoverished wards, no two people's concerns were the same. And so it's, it's, it's important to capture everyone's voice. And so then that way you can kind of create, this is what the citizen says that it's important to them. Once you decide what's important to them and you have allowed um, your voice, your concerns, um, your interests to be captured, then the council members, or in that case, DC government, was able to look at the, this is what Ward 1 is saying, this is, this is kind of how we have collated their responses, and these are the prevalent concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, across the street might be, hey, you know, these trees keep rotting, or this problem may be something else. But you have to have some kind of documentation, because that gives you the roadmap to move forward and to make sure you're engaging and giving the citizens what they've asked for. Because once, you, once you're able to capture that engagement and say, hey, this is what your neighbors are saying that are important to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how I have always engaged people. To, because I think most problems can be solved by literally just listening, listening to people. People want to be heard. And if you show that I'm listening to you, I might not be able to solve it tomorrow or today, but I'm listening to you and I hear you. And I think that quells most people's concerns or, um, 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 you know, I guess some of their, their worries. Like once they know that they've been heard and that they have gone on record to say whatever it is they want to say and that someone has captured it and they know that you're working on it, I think that's all you can ask of any council member, any government, um, you know, any kind of uh, decision-making body. With Sister Bayana's permission, I'm going to open the questions that we receive, but then also I'd like to pose a permanent question to everybody. Mm -hmm. And I'd like for them to spend one minute with this permanent question after answering the other questions. So I'm, I'm just gonna add that in there, but I, as election committee, I'm, I'm asking for that permission. You're speaking about. my permission? Yes, ma'am, I am. In as much as I don't know what the permanent question is, I'm going to give you blind permission. I was going to ask this question, but now. now <laughs> question that's coming from one of the citizens is uh, what intentional communities do you see as inspirational to you? Um, one of the intentional communities that I see is um, Serenby. 
Um, Sarah B, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with Sarah um, mm-hmm. and B. I've looked at other um, communities also throughout um, some of the communities in Pacific Northwest um, <coughs> and other countries as well. Um, and so I look at all of those and I take elements of each community about their self-governance. And I think that it's really important for us um, as, as we move forward in creating this village is to really, really emphasize the self-governance. And when you look at how we're able to come together and kind of um, break, the, um, break the bond or untether ourselves from the government, by utilizing the skills that we have as a group, looking to each citizen that has certain group has certain skill sets, um, I think we become the blueprint ultimately because a lot of these other um, a lot of these other communities have I would say 50, 50, 50 they have looked outside of themselves for the answers and I think that this community is in, unique that we know that we have everything that we need within this community. Um, and so I think that we become, you know, I'm not gonna say better than Sarah B, but I think that we become the blueprint um, because this is completely different than anything that I've, uh, that I've seen. You know, there are self-sustaining communities that have kind of cobbled themselves together that go off grid, but I think this is, this is unique in that most off grid are kind of, um, they're the antithesis of, of um, community. Everyone's kind of for themselves. You know, my family's moving off grid. I'm going to be on 50 acres, and I, I'm excluding community. And so I think what's different about this community is that we aren't excluding community. We're inviting um, like-minded individuals to be self-sustaining, to be um, that blueprint that black folks have oh. always been empowered to be. Is there a- so that was it. I, I was going to say, um, so even though I do see other communities, um, you know, that, that, that offer that, I think that we become the blueprint ultimately. Come on. Okay, so I have the, the my, my one standing question, and it's good we have Brother Cream here. So, Brother Cream, we're doing presentations, you will be number four. Um, <clears throat> but my, my, my standing question that I think is important, and I think that sometimes what happens is that in the community we can become a little too comfortable with thinking that everything will always be okay, and that everyone will always be okay. Um, we have to realize and we have to prepare for the idea of dissidence, defiance, and then also of just falling out mm-hmm. for even good reasons. You know, um, nine times out of ten, we're all some type of, in here somewhere, rebellious people. Um, and it's possible that we turn that rebellion against one another. Um, in those cases, the village council will have to act in order to resolve that. Uh, in the means that they see fit. And what I would like as a standing question is this, that when people do not follow our rules, let's try our best to transition in as quietly as possible. The, 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 when people do not follow our rules uh, that we set in place, uh, when they have, we have a set of people that who might just be separated from the process intentionally, just as we do in regular communities now, and then try to defy the rules once they're set, thinking that that's the proper way to fight something, which we know is not. What are you prepared to suggest to the council as a means to rectify those situations? And if necessary, um, well, actually, I don't even want to go that far, just to resolve those issues uh, where people are absolutely defiant to the rules that we as a community have set. And to piggyback onto that question, I'm going to say that we got that same question from the group. And the question we have is how do you handle conflict? And would you hold a oh, and would you hold a grudge when making decisions? I think 
Actually, I think that that's a little bit separate. And if you're okay, I'd like to hold that off to the next candidate because I want every candidate to answer this one very specifically. Okay. And I think the outcome that, that's intended is actual, actual rules and actions that you would propose to actually resolve the problem. You know, where, where, where would you draw from your creativity on how we can resolve those issues when they come about? Um, well, you know, I would look at obviously whatever, you know, our, our constitution um, describes as um, an offense. Because I think a lot of times we look at things, I'll use the example that you used yesterday, when, um, the, the neighbor who had his, his headlights on, you know, how do you decide what's a nuisance versus a serious infraction? And so I think that when you, first of all, you have to identify whether or not it was a serious infraction or whether or not it was just something that annoyed you. Because things are gonna annoy us, you know. We're gonna have uh, living next to someone who decides to get, you know, four roosters and they crow at three in the morning. And so those, we have to look at those as things that you know you have to live with. Things that you have to. Um, someone decides to mow their lawn, you know, at 5 a.m. And and so I think that once you decide what because what's a serious infraction um, versus what's a um, um, and, um, something that's more of an annoyance, then you take appropriate action. I think when you find a person, I think the first thing to do is to engage that person one on one. You know, you seem to have missed um, all of the meetings. You seem to have mentally checked out. Is there something that we can do, or is there, is there something that's bothering you that you don't feel comfortable coming coming forward with? Because I think once you start to engage a person and you have given them every opportunity to express what it is, because sometimes people aren't, um, they're not forthcoming with whatever the issue is. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding. And I think that once you have documented and you have gone to that person to um, try to remedy whatever it is that, um, you know, if it is something that you can remedy, if they're just like, you know, I don't like being here or, or, or 10 seconds. Um, so I think as a council, we walk them through um, the proper channels. I mean, I think as anything else, um, the last case, uh, the worst case would be um, eviction. You know, um, there are a lot of communities that their members have been, um, I don't want to say ostracized, but there has to be something depending on the, the, the heaviness of the infraction that has to be remedied because we are not going to allow, some, you know, a poison apple to taint the, the larger community because that kind of virus spreads. And so if you can't cut out the cancer and, that, and you have identified that person is in fact cancerous as opposed to, um, you have to look at what their intentions are. So if, if in fact you've identified this person's intention is to do malice, then I think that for the greater good, they need to be separated and um, dismissed from the community. Thank you, Sister Nina. It's incredible as I stand here because about how the mind works. Because as I, I stand here because my own like nerves, because standing in front of people, especially people that you value, that you see value in, it creates um, a humility in your mind. And so I'm speaking to you from that specific humility and a little bit of my own bravery, right? Because you gotta get past it. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here to present to Freedom Village Citizens. My name is Sister Izebe Amauni Onyango Muhammad. Um, Izebe means long expected child, not exactly sure, what I'm supposed to be expected for, but I'll let you know when I get there. Um, I was born into an intentional community, and that intentional community was a small African-centered community in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, my parents, born John Saunders and Linda James, were um, changed their names to Ingina Onyango and Ahmad Onyango. Um, they named me Izebe, which means long expected child because my mom was in labor with me for two, two days. She told the doctors that I would come when I was supposed to come, not when they said I was supposed to come. Um, it's a legacy that I'm still working to 
live up to. Um, so as a little girl, you know, I had a naming ceremony, African naming ceremony, like out in the middle of the park, out in the blackest of the blackest neighborhood, right? Um, and all through, maybe up until about nine or 10, there were always all these quote unquote conscious black people around in this very black city of Baltimore, right? Um, and so, but around 10, my parents separated. And that means my world separated as well, right? My mom, my dad went one way and decided to kind of keep the community going until it dissolved. And then my mother kind of went out into what I would call the regular like world. Um, it was a major shift for me, right? We went from vegetarian all the way up until I was nine to like, by the time I was 18, you know, we were eating pork and you know, all of these different things. And we were Americanized, but in a way that I could see in a way that I could still be conscious about. It was a very interesting time. Um, and so at 18, when I broke off from my family, um, I went to try to find what I felt was peace. And it wasn't in a lot of that last nine years, because you're talking about a parents that separated, you're talking about a community that felt broken, that I wasn't a, like a part of anymore, um, which made me feel a little broken, right? Um, so by the time we got into, by the time I got into high school, uh, I was a part of uh, what brother brother Farouk has kind of coined this like rebel. Don't feel like it was with a cause, right? But it was a part of like rebellious, right? Because we knew that where we were wasn't a thing that we wanted to do, but we weren't exactly sure where we were going, right? Um, watch Malcolm X, right? We had protests at the school from people that were being expelled for things that just being black, right? Um, and so by the time I was 19, I found, and I feel kind of like it found me, the Nation of Islam. So I'm now, I'm a member of the Nation of Islam. This year makes 27 years growing up in the Nation of Islam. Um, and so I'm very grateful that what I found in that was concepts of freedom, justice, and equality that I've been searching for my whole life. Um, I am a mother of four, six altogether, right? The first two are like mother and love, two. They're, they're older. Um, I am a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and been taught by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Um, I have experienced through this I have experienced through this last 10 years of my life in community engagement, in, in being the chairman of the board, um, the, the director of a nonprofit, and mostly I would say that I, right now, I stand in the type of curiosity that makes me want to build what I always wanted to see in our lives, build what my parents and what my children would be able to live through and thrive through. So, I think I'll pause there. Yeah? Uh, yeah please. Can I have some questions? Yes. Um, I'm going to go to this one first, because I mm -hmm. think this is a pertinent question. What methods, tactics, do you think are beneficial to protect us against attacks so we don't become another Black Wall Street? Thank you. You have three minutes. Thank, oh, I have three minutes, perfect. So I think when we're talking about that particular um, area, I think we're both preemptive, right? That there's a lot to do on the beginning, on the front end of that particular subject. And then so that the consequences that will absolutely be necessary on the back end can be one of the last and final resorts. Um, I think that if we establish a strong constitution, if we establish a strong culture before and as people walk in, I think Brother Farouk said it so perfectly when he talked about how as we start to regulate and make systems for ourselves, it will become less free for certain people, right? And I'm talking about even me, right? It will be less free, and I have the decision. I have the decision to make. Um, I think the idea of being accountable for each of us 
for that type of system beforehand and understanding what happens beforehand is very crucial to this, right? Um, I think it would also be the responsibility of the council to create systems to attempt to catch it or to catch that um, the mind in a very, uh, uh, or at, at least observe the mind in a very early way, <coughs> right? Um, I think about the, the Brother Fruk said, don't clear the land until you're ready to build, right? We're not clearing the land. And if you do clear the land, that stuff grows back very quickly. But we have the opportunity to observe it. And so that's the middle. First is preemptive. That's the middle. And on the end, we can't be, the only way we can have freedom is if we can defend it, right? And even if that means defending it from the mind of us, that's also necessary. Um, I spent, of my 27 years, I spent the first, how old am I? The first 10 years in the military of the Nation of Islam, right? Um, as, as a vanguard. And not to say that I ever want to be it, because that's the, the code is, um, we are not the aggressor in word or deed, right? But if we are attacked, we fight with those who fight with us, right? Because we want to be successful. And so even if that means that that system right there is checking me, from my own um, wayward thoughts or my own wayward actions towards who are God's people. So I have the second question, and I'm not going to take it from the crowd. Instead, I'm, I'm going to extend that question that's right there. Um, on the Black Wall Street topic, and especially since this is a recording event, I think it's really important that we ask this question. A lot of people don't take time to analyze the Black Wall Street issue and what actually happened. Um, one of the ex F elements of that, there was a national, uh, a, a, it was a national event where the President of the United States was encouraging uh, people to promote this concept that black towns were in rebellion against white people. And part of that was a kind of code word that was published in the Wall Street Journal and in the New York Times. This code word was supposed to be, get them. And that get them had a basis on a black person attacking a white person. And so they, the, the president at the time made white people in the country feel like they were defending themselves by doing the Red Summer of 1917, by the attack of Black in 1921, the attack on Rosewood. They all started a very similar way. Someone claimed that a white woman had been molested, raped, or otherwise. In Black Wall Street, it was someone inside of an elevator, just a black man, not in an elevator, a black man was sitting in a closed confinement with a white woman, and then that white woman claimed when she got out of that space that she had been molested. Whether it's true or not, no one actually knows, actually, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But it opens up a very interesting question for us. A lot of people will believe that their actions outside of the village have no impact on the village. However, if you live in the village, and you commit a crime of any nature. Now, I'm talking about a real crime. I'm not talking about being accused of something. Sure. I'm talking about something that causes someone else to want to take retribution against you, sure. whether it be a legal, a legal organization or otherwise. In this case, I'm talking about a legal thing. You do something that mm -hmm. caused someone to come, and you believe the village can be an enclave for your protection, mm -hmm. forcing every other citizen to be your military to try to protect you mm -hmm. against another force. Mm -hmm. The question becomes, how do we as a council handle these situations? And that's a heavy one, and I know it's very heavy. It's very heavy. Uh, but, you know, in the principles of freedom, we wrote the, about the necessity for internal law before external law. Mm -hmm. And so this is about self-policing. And so my question is, what would be some of your suggestions and your mindsets that you would enact as a council member in an emergency situation to resolve such an issue? Thank you. Three minutes. Three minutes. So I think the first thing I would say is that if we don't have a collective system for this particular issue or challenge, meaning if we don't all come to agreement for what it is that we decide that we want to do, I think that is one of the first crucial things that we have to do. Right? That we decide what we're going to do together. Right? That's number one. Um, there's a line of thinking that we are taught in our um, Muslim girls training class, which is it's not enough to be innocent. It's not enough to be innocent. 
we're working to be above reproach, right? So that the idea, the very idea of uh, wrongdoing or accusing, um, our character speaks for ourselves. Um, and I think that that is something that should be a part of the way we think about law breaking, making laws, creating systems. Um, I would also say that if we have the type of relationship with each other, right, with each other's families, then the concept of putting myself or putting you in danger for the sake of my own self, that there's ways for us to enact or to think and to let the community itself know that this is not a place or a haven for our iniquities. Um, I think that there's language. I think that there are actions. And if we can all agree on it, and we can agree that that's the way we will operate together without exception, then that is what creates the peace that we want to see. That's the thing that allows our shoulders when we are around each other and with each other, wherever it is, whether it's on the land or at Lundy Lodge, allows us to feel like you are community to each other. And of course you have one minute to answer the final standing question and that is about how actual, actual resolutions that you would resolve uh, when people within inside of our own community um, uh, usurp the laws and usurp our rules, um, how would you actually handle that situation? Um, you know, as soon as you say that, and it's funny, because I don't think there is, if, if, if I am granted this position of service, I don't think there is a me, right? I don't think there's just a me, right? There will be, there's always the entire village to consider and then specifically in decision making, there's other members of the council, right? That are working to enact freedom, justice, and equality, right? Um, I think also um, something that Sister Nina said was so very key because often we look at inconvenience like an absolute act of aggression, right? And this is because that's the society we grew up in, right? As soon as somebody says something or does something, we have a tendency because we are, we feel like we need to cover ourselves, right? Um, we feel like we need to, seconds. Um, so I think the decision is never a me, but I think it's always bu built in freedom, justice, and equality for everyone. And thanks, Sister Zigbe, for our answers and for our presentation. Grand Rising family. Um, uh, my government name is Lynn Mosley. Um, my alias in Slack channel and Facebook page, if you don't know, is Kamari Dream Jobs and Zori. <coughs> um, uh, 53 years old, hail from Jamaica, Queens, uh, New York City is where I grew up. My first 18 years, um, February 1969 when I was born. Uh, so grew up in an environment that was very challenging. It was all during the crack epidemic those kinds of things that were going on in New York City. Um, uh, home life was very challenging for me um, in terms of it being unstable, but um, my mom did her best to go to, to make sure I was engaged in certain things uh, to, to basically shield me from becoming a product of the, of the streets, if you will. Um, so uh, I remember when I was in fifth or sixth grade, you know, I was, I was acting out. I was in rebellion, if you will. <laughs> but the, the one, one teacher saw that there was something else going on, you know, engaged my mom. They decided that um, I needed to be in, in, in certain classes to get me focused. Um, so from seventh grade to twelfth grade, I spent a lot of time in the <coughs> placement classes, stuff like that. Um, I channeled all of that energy into basically artistic endeavors. Um, spent a lot of summers at the School of Visual Arts in Cooper Jean in Manhattan, um, creating, drawing, all that kind of stuff. Um, but after that time, mom was basically like, hey, you know, there's, there's no money for college and this and that, so we're going to have to figure something else out. 
Um, I was kind of looking forward to kind of leaving home anyway and being on my own. So I ended up joining the Air Force, um, took basic training, 30 days. Uh, after that, they dropped me in the bowels of the Pentagon um, uh, as a telecommunications <coughs> expert. Uh, spent four years in that very insane environment, you know, so that's the seed of basically American power, right? Uh, imperialism, capitalism. Um, our facility was basically responsible for all communications <clears throat> from the National Military Command Center out to every single major command, black ops location across the planet. So um, I excelled in their uh, to the point where after some time I realized this probably this probably isn't for me. As much as they tried to get me to stay in that environment, I said, no, I'm just here to do my four years and I'm out. I did that, ended up uh, working at uh, Goddard Space Flight uh, in Maryland for NASA for a couple of years. Um, and since that time, I've been basically a research and development engineer uh, in various capacities ever since. So I've got 35 years basically in scientific tech research and development. Um, so things like um, detailed technical writing, hundreds of pages of documents um, uh, is, is, is nothing for me. We got some family members coming in, so stand by. <laughs> um, you want us to pause your, we'll pause your time so everybody can come on in. But then it's all they come. I'll grab any chairs that you see. Stop like y'all. Stop like y'all. How you doing? Well, that's good. We're going to get y'all's presentation in too. Uh, Brother David, you're number, you're number five on the presentation list. Yes, sir. <laughs> you walk right into it. <laughs> All right, if we can get set up, Brother Lynn is in the middle of a, of a presentation. Uh, so we want to get set up as quickly as possible. And as quietly as possible. Uh, Brother Lynn, you can resume. Uh, you have uh, your three minutes in, you've got two minutes left. Uh, uh, so my day to day, as, it, as it, it, it would apply to our council member uh, membership, if you will. Um, I'm currently, I guess, considered uh, by the, the company I work for, Charter Communications, uh, the director of engineering, if you will. So um, I have I have responsibility for about eight or nine other junior engineers. So um, in that respect, I'm used to uh, being in a very educational um, uh, mode, if you will, in terms of teaching other engineers what they need to know to do their jobs. Um, that position also comes with being having to also manage people and their humanity. Um, while I was on the special committee, I had a I had a, a a period of about four weeks where I had to sit there and deal with uh, managing various projects, um, reassigning things. Um, in the midst of one engineer's wife dying, another engineer's wife tried to commit suicide, and two other engineers getting COVID for the third and fourth time. So um, while trying to participate in Freedom Nation, the special committee, uh, and, a bunch, and taking care of my own family. Um, so, so lots of challenges around that. Um, but uh, uh, because of my 35 years experience, um, I'm able to kind of step up in those roles and not be as rational and scientific with everything because there is a very, very much a human component in everything that we do. Thank you, Brother Lynn. Um, we have the first question, Sister Bayana, and just your mind those questions asked. You have three minutes in order to answer it. Brother Lynn, or Kamari, which would you, my first question, which would you prefer to be called? Lynn's fine. Okay. Brother Lynn, what package products might our community be able to offer to the wider society if we're looking from a commercial basis? What can we give? I, um, I want to step in on that because I don't think that's a village council question. Well, and I don't, I don't think yeah. that is something that we would ask of the village council yes. to be able to provide. The economic development per se is not a direct function. Okay, um, so I think that give, <laughs> no, let's no, <laughs> call them out. Let's just call, let's just call a different, a different, a different question. Do you have a different, another question? Um, 
Well, I do have that question I started to ask the sister earlier. That we kind of. How do you handle conflict? Ah, so. Um, I got three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> um, I'll use an example from work three years ago. Um, Caucasian colleague engineer came up to me <coughs> um, uh, and out of the blue, um, I don't, let me preface that with saying I'm only one of three black engineers in a predominantly 87% white male organization. So that comes with its own <coughs> set of microaggressions, things being said. So a white colleague came up to me, had some issue with um, something he thought I didn't do. Um, he, he, he made it quite the spectacle as I was sitting in my location, very loud, boisterous. Everybody else in the place heard it. Um, of course, you know, my initial uh, response was very emotional internally. Um, I calmly told him I disagreed with that. Um, long story short, the conflict took place. I kept it to myself, um, told my manager about it. He tried to brush it off. I wasn't cool with that. I ended up going to HR, making a, a complaint, following their, their guidelines for what harassment in the workplace was. Had stuff underlined, highlighted, this is what he did, this is what he said. Long story short, they blew it off. I said, okay, that's fine. Um, I'm still there in that capacity, but the word got around about what happened. And because of that, um, I guess a, a new kind of um, respect for me in terms of standing up for myself um, rose up. And so the other people of color in our group, Pakistani, Indian, Chinese, um, now come to me when they have issues with our white colleagues. Um, when I've had to deal with conflicts between my engineers, uh, I do my best to try and, and find common ground first. I don't necessarily focus on the issue uh, in and of itself. I'll say, hey, John, what is your view of this issue? Steve, what is your view of this issue? Once you guys explain that to me, let's try to establish some common ground in terms of how, how can we get past it and continue moving forward. So I, I'm not someone that tries to uh, fuel the fire, if you will. Um, it, uh, I'm always first to try and find a common ground between people that have a different perspective or idea about a situation or circumstance. Brother Baruch, you have a question. Yes, ma'am. So the question uh, from the citizen, and by the way, for anyone who doesn't know about it, we are, if you have a question, uh, the format is that the two election committee will ask a question. So please write your questions down put them on a sheet of paper and hand them to Sister Diana uh, so that we can ask those questions. How free is free? And it says, i.e. drugs, gaming, violence, loud music, partying. So I'm guessing uh, you can take that as it is, but I probably just put the phrase around it. The question is um, what, I think the proper question is what is your position on the rules around people doing things that involve noise, or I should say any disturbances whatsoever that might impact our common areas. Uh, given the village council is in charge of our common areas, not necessarily what we do on our land itself, um, that, that what would be your position on how we should conduct the rules that might be developed for managing those common areas when it comes to things like noise, drugs, alcohol use, things of that nature. Um, and I, no one in this room, by the way, let me be very clear, but someone else said early on who visited running butt naked down the street. <laughs> <laughs> I told her, I don't think that's my <laughs> version. But, um, <laughs> three years old. <laughs> 42. <laughs> Said, that is my definition of freedom. I said, I don't think this is your place. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think um, Three minutes. We, we clearly, as a, as a collective, as a community, have to uh, agree on a, a certain level of um, setting, setting a standard for <laughs> integrity and character, honesty. Um, 
in terms of our behavior, our interactions with each other, um, I do believe those things can be um, specifically specifically codified um, to the to the betterment for for the entire community. Um, and an example of that, I was here last year with the family, and for those that, that remember, at the time, I was the um, uh, Minister of Information for the Fred Hampton Gun Club. Um, I, I, but as time went on, um, I, I saw some, some distinct character integrity issues that, that didn't align with my values. Um, and as much as I loved the family, I, I said, look, I have to step back. Because um, up to that point, I had already kind of established who I was and pr tried to provide that example. Um, but that wasn't filtering as much as I wanted it to up and down the, ch the organization, especially at the leadership level. Um, so I had, I had to step out of that. Um, but uh, when it comes to our community, that's that's kind of what we're going to have to do is to, is to kind of codify that thing, those things, and agree as a collective um, what's acceptable behavior, character, integrity, uh, and what's not, you know, so that we don't lose the, uh, cohesion, uh, right? So, yeah. Okay. And then we have our standing question for which you have one minute to answer, and that is. Uh, what are some of the policies um, that you would put in place or methods to deal with members of our community who um, cease to follow the rules and the laws that are put in place by the village council and by the citizens at large? Uh, I, I think one of those key things, um, as mentioned by the, the two previous uh, sisters um, was that is that we we have to um, uh, agree that hey you know the, um, let's engage that individual first somewhat like what I do at work I, you, you have to engage that person and kind of find out where they're coming from in terms of their perspective and you know and once I once I know where you're coming from in terms of trying to stand in your shoes uh, and where you're at uh, we, we, we can try and, and, and come to some kind of agreement about whether or not um, this is the right environment for you or not. And, and, um, and, and, and it could be that maybe it's not and you'll have to find another community uh, that's a little bit more free for you. Um, you know, but, but, and, and then there's, there's codification or, you know, around what that looks like and stuff, right? So, um, I think you know once we once we get those things kind of written down and agreed by agree, an agreement amongst the community, um, it makes things a lot easier in terms of hey you, you can't say you didn't know that you couldn't do this because we all agree collectively that you can't do that and it's written right here. So we thank Brother Lynn for his presentation. Good afternoon, my name is Kareem Flanoy. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my quick black background. I grew up on Cleveland Avenue in Atlanta. Um, my interactions with the community as a whole, I like to call it the dominant culture, may be a little different from everyone else's. I grew up in a predominantly African American neighborhood, so my first interaction with the dominant culture, maybe buttons who went on the train, they were like kind of mythological, we really didn't see them. Uh, all my teachers was African. Um, the mothers, the fathers, everything in our community. Uh, we had one Caucasian family, and every Friday they come home from um, elementary, they would sick their dogs on us. So, you know, about five years old, we ran from dogs from them. As we get older, um, my mom sent me to an MTM program. Uh, minority to majority. Never do that to your kids. Um, that's when I got introduced to the word nigger because the only time you heard in my neighborhood was when somebody was actually mad about the fight. Um, so that when I got exposed to their subtle hints of microaggression, uh, racism, and what they want to stay into is what's called survival mode. You cannot be a genius of who you are supposed to be if you're constantly kept in survival mode. So that's what we have to look at. Um, that's middle school. I'm on fast forward to high school. We had, I went to Tri-Cities High School in East Point. We had one white principal, Victor Lee. He suspended me half of my senior year for walking into the school. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds crazy, we ended up going to the Board of Education. 
And they were like, well, we don't want you to go back there, but we're not going to fail you. We understand what happened. And they swept it under the rug. All because I didn't call this man sir. He popped his finger at me, pointed, and said, come here. I just walked in and said, you slapped your duck fingers at dogs. After that, I was on his list. Went to the Marine Corps, did four years in the Marine Corps. Got more exposed to the souls of white folks. And at that point, when I got the Marine Corps, I did four years, um, 99 to 03. I went to work at the Ritz Carlton. Interesting thing about the Ritz Carlton, they have impeccable service. So they taught me my interpersonal skills. The military will teach you attack and bearing, how to you know, take it and, and, and suppress it. But the interpersonal skills is what I developed while I was at the Ritz Carlton. And that allows you to analyze conflict, to simplify rules. And I think that's what we have here. We have to have, even though we're going to have everything codified, we have to simplify because a nation is a bunch of different cultures, a bunch of people with different backgrounds. So all we're trying to do is put together the best of each other's culture and have it carry the nation. What you're doing on your house is one thing, but what we're doing out here in these common areas and how we interact with each other, that is going to be cultural based and we have to merge them cultures together. So there's no superior culture, there's no really, you know, there's little gray areas because at the end of the day, we all have a cultural link to Africa. We all have a cultural link. We don't mistreat elders. We don't mistreat children. I think everybody in here household probably raised like that. So boom, we already linked up. Everything else is just a little gray area that we have to work through. So um, when we, we're here today because we see that the dominant culture does not have our best interests in heart hasn't had since we ran into them and we saved them in the 700s. I'm sure they let them kind of die out. Personal opinion. But <laughs> since we chose not to because we know those are our, our distant cousins and we embraced them and we wanted to rock them back to humanity, we end up over here. So it's that simple. Right now, we were removed from the table of humanity and we were reclaiming our responsibility as men and women. To me, that's what Freedom Nation is and that's why I'm here running for council. This is to set a precedent of what we always have been, we are linked to the past, and we're gonna show our children the future. We ran nations, continents, and we have to do it again, but guess where you started? You started in your, with yourself, your family, your community, then you all that goes out to the nation. So you have to get yourself right. So once we got ourselves right, we get our community right, and then we go out to our full nationhood and we pose to right. be. That's right. All right. Yeah. Just the billion. Do you have your first question? <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. I'm going to have to go back. I haven't gotten any new questions, so I'll go back and start asking. Please, some please be involved yourself and ask questions. Please, Anybody please, please. This is your community. Okay, please involve yourself and ask questions. All right. Um, what method tactics do you think are beneficial to protect us against attacks so we don't become another black Wall Street? Two things. First, you have three minutes. Oh, thank you. Economics. This country runs on capitalism. I am not a capitalist, but I do understand the importance of economics. You have a strong financial base. You can do a lot of things in this country dealing with the laws. Building strong communities with our neighbors is the next part. Not the dominant neighbors, but the neighbors. When you look at Hancock County, you might not know it. it's predominantly African. All we got to do is reach out and get to know them. Why? Because the dominant culture does not come in ones, does not come in twos, they come in threes and more. They are afraid of numbers. They see, they see you and they're like, oh, that guy over there, he's dangerous. Let's get through them. What are they going to do when they get to see a thousand of us working? Peacefully, they're gonna leave us alone, and then they're gonna try to befriend you, which is part of their culture, and try to get to the money. So the best way is, like I said, a strong defense, good offense. We get economics right. As far as internal things, of course, this is Georgia. This is staying your ground. Understand your laws and enforce. Cause for us, as long as you know the law, you can enforce the law. This is private property. Put a couple signs up and take your own risk. <laughs> That's it. We get our money right and we get everything else right and then we are unified and then that's how we're going to defend ourselves. You got my vote. <laughs> 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 
I have a question, but this question is coming. This question is straight from, from, from me as a, as a member of the election committee. Um, one of the biggest things that the council will have to do is to represent the entire community to those in our external environment. Uh, that becomes the, especially the county, uh, at some point. Uh, I don't believe it'll happen in the next two years. Um, but it also becomes to other people, we need to start building inroads. We have to build inroads to the, um, to the Senate. We need to build inroads into the House of Representatives in the state of Georgia. We really do need to build those inroads starting now. Um, sometimes I think that the line of uh, revolutionary talk and the line of peaceful participation in society conflict each other directly. And if not dealt with in the absolute level of sensitivity, we run the risk of being inappropriately associated with something from a political standpoint that we do not have a stance on. And it will destroy our opportunities to build relationships that could enhance our community in the future. <laughs> My question is, is what is your method when it comes to building relationships with those people who do not have any care for our revolutionary mindset and instead would like to align themselves with us for economic and also for civil uh, reasons. And who also might disagree with us, but we still need to find a way to gain their support. Okay. By good old fashioned capitalism, we lobby. Uh, I know about several aides who are in the state capitol, and we will talk to them, do we make, get the lunches with the senators. Um, you, know, you can request meetings with your representatives. So that comes from the lobbying, because you have to have key people in place who can speak for you in those back rooms you're not invited to. And that's all they're doing. They're lobbying successfully against our interests. So we have to lobby and check our interests. So not only do we have to have a great out front, we have to have a great back room also. But there will probably be some people that everybody don't know about, but that has our champions, but they're doing it inside it in the back rooms. That's how, that's how you got to balance that. Because your politicians, they might can't say, we support freedom nation here, but they can say nay to that vote against freedom nation. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that balance. We get the community here, and we get the other guys over there. A lot of these citizens in Georgia are made on the golf course. A lot of them are made in areas that we're not normally invited to. So we have to meet and lobby the people who are invited and then we meet those people and they understand what we're doing, that we are not a threat to them. We actually are benefit to Hancock County and become a benefit to Hancock County. We become a benefit to other smaller counties. See what I'm saying? Because they got a big push, Atlanta. That's the main push, Alpharetta, you know, stuff like that. But all the people and the money and the land is out here. So we can, we can go ahead and push Georgia first by pushing Hancock County first. And then we can slowly shift, because we are a good highway. They're gonna, um, the IT world is coming down to Atlanta, Georgia. But guess what, what part of the IT world already been here? Augusta is the headquarters for the military IT world. We right in the middle. They're gonna have to come see us sooner or later. And we gotta be prepared and ready for them. So when they come this way, when we go out, they're gonna love us. And that's all we're gonna do, because we're gonna make them money. At the end of the day, racism is rhetoric for them. It affects us, but they want the money. And the greatest form of white supremacy you'll ever see in this planet is the American dollar. So we're going to go ahead and get that American dollar and control it. Right, right. <laughs> the last standing question, and you have one minute to answer it, is what are the policies and methods that you would propose or enact in dealing with our own citizens who refuse to follow our rules or follow anything like fees, so forth and so on. And you have one minute to answer. That's where your own personal skills come in at. Because if you can't afford some fees we can put in place, we need to talk to you about that. A lot of people do not like the stress about their finances. But if you came down here and help build this place, we really shouldn't be trying to take this place from you. You are vital. So let's talk about payment plan. Let's see are these fees really even needed. Because I, I believe all fees should have a deadline. <laughs> 
You know, you, you get you get the money for what you need it for, but then you only keep on doing it 10, 20 years later. So a lot of, a lot of conflict comes from confusion and misunderstanding. Are you misunderstanding the rules? Are you confused by the wording? So the wording has to be simple for everybody. Because remember, this is a nation with people from different levels of education and background. So we can have a, a straight rules here for everybody for the state, but we're going to have to simplify that for our members. And if you keep it, your, to me, your measure of intelligence is how simple you can make something. If you can take it complicated and make it simple, we're a room full of intelligent people. We're going to have an intelligent nation. So let's simplify this stuff and get everything started. And we thank Brother Kareem for his presentation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'm there for the Shadow of God with Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, my name is Brother David Muhammad. I am uh, what you would call a serial entrepreneur, entrepreneur, <laughs> entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> right? Um, and I think my, uh, the accepted nomination for a Freedom Village Council. Um, I'm really a person who, I don't do a lot of talking, I'm a person who acts, right? So I don't really have a big long speech, but I can tell you this right here, right? Well, just a little bit of my background. I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland, right? Um, I've been serving in the Nation of Islam uh, 33 years. Out of 33 years, I've been a captain of the Nation of Islam, trained in men, Los Angeles, Baltimore, Long Beach, San Diego. Um, so I'm just a, a type of person who like to get the work done. I'm not, a, you know, individuals who want to stand around and just wait for things to happen. I try to make things happen, right? So um, my entrepreneurial um, set of skills, I've had my uh, different types of businesses um, from a security firm that I've worked with uh, HUD, did most of their um, things they didn't, the things that they didn't want to do. Nobody else wanted to, these projects, nobody else wanted to take over. We took those projects on in Washington, D.C., right? Um, <clears throat> corporate America, I mean, uh, okay, from that, bookstore, clothing store, I done done it all. You name it, I done done it all, right? So, um, and now, we we spent our last 20 years, me and my wife spent our last 20 years doing environmental uh, literacy and environmental advocacy, right? So those are our strong points. I'm uh, talking about food justice um, and, you know, just making sure that uh, we reconnecting our people back to the planet and each other, right? So that's, uh, we we actually run a nonprofit now um, and we're in San Diego with the nonprofit. <laughs> And we just registered in Georgia, so we plan to bring those 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 uh, services to Georgia, mainly to our area and Sparta, Georgia, Hancock County. Um, so uh, you know, you 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 know, I'm just ready for the questions at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, we 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 uh, Sister Vienna. Uh, no one's given me any questions, but I have a question. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm going to try to keep it fresh. We're talking about the council. We're talking about being members of the council. So overall, it's basically what we're trying to do is we're establishing a small village, a small city, a small municipality, pretty much. What, how do you see us coming together as a group, how do you see those common things that we're going to need to have as a village, common things? Fire, maybe a firefighting, maybe a security or a police department, maybe, you know, the common things, electricity, the water, the, you know, all of those kinds of things that you usually have in different cities and communities, how do you see the council bridging all of that together for the community? Well, uh, my, so I would say through collective work and responsibility, right? And I'm talking about mainly through co cooperatives, right? I think we should look at our utilities um, and look at how we can um, become owners of our own utilities as a citizen. 
So we do it cooperative style. That would be my, my, my recommendation for things like our utilities, even for things like our uh, um, <coughs> public safety council, right? The one thing I would like to establish will be uh, various councils that can deal with various things. Like our public safety council would be responsible for the security of the village, right? We'll be also responsible for the uh, fire safety of the village, right? Another thing, one of the things in my background is also as a um, community emergency response uh, team trainer, right? So I would like to incorporate that amongst us as a village so that um, each specific area, we talking about 205 acres, what we talking about, so each area will have a response team in each area of the village. When things happen, we don't have to call everybody. We know who to call. Those people will get into action, go into motion, and bring about what's necessary we need to bring about for, our, for ourselves. Um, I want to ask the same question that I asked Brother Green, um, and that is about representation. Um, I know that we've had a chance, and I know you've been here for quite some time now, so you've had a chance to attend meetings in Hancock and meet different people. I was sitting with Sisty and she mentioned you last time I was talking with her um, and everything else. There's definitely multiple sides to politicians. My mm -hmm. dad used to say, how can they help it? They're politics, they're many blood soaps. And so, <laughs> and so, so there's, there's many sides to different people. However, um, you know, we are, we are a group that's consolidated in a single place, but at no camp can we be foolish enough to consider ourselves isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, the village council is probably one of the bigger roles will be how we interface uh, with all these different elements and how we build relationships that are long term and long lasting. Um, and it's very realistic that the tenure, council tenure, can extend way beyond two years if someone has also developed those relationships to a point where we can no longer get rid of them or we need to have them in place. Um, what, from what you've done so far and from what you know in your past, what are the things that you will do actively in order to represent the village when it comes to the outside forces that we need to sway in our faith? Um, I would have to use my um my years of experience running nonprofits and uh, um, community-based organizations. But um, as a community uh, organizer, right, I think organizing us to the point where uh, we know exactly what we are, uh, what our end goal is for Freedom Village, right? And that is the township, right? So I think as, our, um, as we begin the journey Right, like I've started now, like you said, brother, from going to the council meetings locally, um, sitting there, just listening and seeing what's going on, learning the players, learning who's running the city, who's the people we need to make friends with, and things like that. I've already begun that process now for us, so that uh, when time comes for us to, uh, you know, to, when we get more citizens down on the property, we can now know how we need to strategize our, our, our game plan, right, again. My uh, philosophy is cooperative, eco cooperative working, you know, so we would take the, you know, the best of us who has those skills, those people skills, who has those, that, that knowledge of the political knowledge and things like that. And we would actually uh, like to use those individuals as our, um, as our community outreach council, so to speak, or community outreach committee, so to speak, right? that would do those those things, people who have this experience. I'm very heavy on utilizing people that have the, the experience to do things. I'm not a person who's going off with somebody who's going to like somebody, we trust somebody, we can use you as this and that, no. If you have the skill, you have the background, we'd like to use you to do this for us. So that's my whole thing is, Pulling on the citizens and actually asking the citizens, to, you know, um, along with your along with your citizens, right? Also, uh, we need to use your skills. As as I said, I was a captain for over 20 years, so my my, my whole thing is get the maximum out of each man. So if a person likes to be 
they're out front, likes to be in the public eye, likes to, you know, okay, we need to fix you up, and we gotta fix you up to make you fit the, look the part for us, you can do that, right? So somebody else likes to, you know, they like to run around and just a busy body, I got something for you too, right? So that's just, you know, that, that's how I, I, I operate. I pull from your strengths. And we have the last standing question that takes, you got one minute to answer. And that question is, how do you plan, or what actual remedies do you, would you plan to put in place uh, for our own citizens who refuse to follow any rules or considerations or, um, that we have put in place in order to ensure that we have a peaceful community? Um, brother, I've been doing conflict resolution, crisis intervention training for about 15 years. So when it comes down to individuals who uh, don't want to follow the rules, right, again, that's a conversation we have to have with them, right? And we got we to gotta let them, we got to show them the standard, right? Let them know where they are, right? Tell them how to get to the standard and then follow up. 